the really big institutional investors, they're pretty smart. They've got pretty smart people and economists on their staff. And the reason they're buying multifamily right now and really making prices go up for syndicators like us is because they know it's a safe place to park money as a preservation of capital play. They're not focused on getting their investors 10, 14, 20% right now. They're saying, let's put it on something stable, an asset that's going to go up in value with inflation. The income's going to go up with inflation because if expenses go up, we're raising rents. And their primary is preservation of capital. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Anna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here with you today. Hey, the pleasure's mine. The pleasure's mine. That's a, that's a fun background and a fun bio. You know, the, 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 the same questions I ask everybody who comes on this show is, where'd you start? Where are you now? And quickly, how did you get there? <laughs> quickly is really hard, but I'll really try, right? Okay. Um, so, you know, I started out in the financial sector, worked with uh, traditional investments for over 20 years. And I knew a lot about what to do with wealth once you had it and where to park it, how to make it grow, how to preserve it, tax benefits, et cetera. But no one ever really taught me how do I create wealth of my own if I don't have it, right? And I had a child in 2003 and I desperately wanted to be home with them. I had climbed up the corporate ladder, thought, you know, that was the way to create wealth, a slow, long way and wanted to be home. And during that time, I was watching a lot of HGTV and flip this house. And they convinced you, you could replace a six figure income with two flips a year. And I thought, hey, let's try it. Um, didn't go so well. The first time we flipped, we lost some money. And my husband said, we're never doing that again, right? So I knew we can do this if we just are willing to try again. And he said, no, we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to 2007, we relocated from Houston, Texas to Hershey, Pennsylvania area to start a business, to start my husband's chiropractic business. And we decided to buy a practice that had apartments above it. And so we became landlords by necessity. And I said, you know, this could be smart to have some tenants covering some of the, the mortgage payment instead of us leasing space. So let's learn how to be landlords. And we did that. We house hacked a four unit apartment building after selling a big house in Houston. So let's step back a little bit, protect our you know, finances while you start a new business. And I thought I was going to lose my job because I was transferring across country. And that um, was going really well. And then the market crash, we had the great recession of 2008, 2009. Right. I worked for AIG at the time, which was one of the biggest players that almost went down during that time. Lost about two thirds, Sam, of my 401k and in companies I knew were never coming back. And I had a crossroads and a crisis. And I said, what are we going to do, you know, to survive and feed our family? If I lose my job at AIG, I have no more backup, not much left in the retirement plan. And I thought the only thing going really well is my apartments. So let's buy another four unit building with what left I have of my 401k. We bought it. They were stable through the recession. And we knew that at that point, we couldn't trust a job. We couldn't trust the stock market. We needed to take control of our finances. And that began a, a long journey um, of really building a, a high net worth through real estate that I never could have built, you know, without it. Wow. That's, um, I mean, that's a compelling story, first off, and it's, and it's painful, you know, it, pain, it pains yes. me because so many people are in that same position, even today. Yes. Even with the stock market at an all time high, they're not protected, you know, from a, from a recession or from not that anyone's completely protected, but there's still no backup. Right. So you guys did that. And then how, what, what was your, your progression from that point forward? I mean, you had four, eight units at this point, And then, then what'd you do next? It was really, really tough, Sam, because I, I knew at that point, I, I decided if I'm going to be a landlord, I need to read a couple books about apartment investing. And I bought Multifamily Millions by Dave Lindahl, still an amazing book for anybody that wants to kind of know how you build wealth through, through multifamily. And it was very eye-opening to say, you know, if I keep adding value, forcing appreciation, and then trading up and trading up and trading up, I can really create some wealth pretty quickly, plus the income that, that we really needed. That was our, our primary motivation at the time was income, not necessarily growth and net worth. Um, but I knew this is the path and we need to do it. And I went to a large seminar, the first one that I know of in the country that convinced you to buy big syndications together. 
and went to that conference, hired the coach and Sam, she turned out to be a fraud. Mm. She took money from a lot of people. She hijacked a course, um, pretended to be a CCIM and she wasn't. And it really jaded me from big multifamily real estate. I said, forget it. If this is the kind of people in the guru space, I want nothing to do with it. We're just going to buy our own. That was a mistake, um, you know, that I got jaded and, and waited too long to jump into the bigger deals, but I didn't have money. And the, the banks were telling me, no, you know, I worked for AIG. We had $700,000 in business startup debt with my husband's equipment and the building we bought. And he was a brand new business. He was a risk. I was a risk. And real estate was a risk at that time. So I found deals, but I could not find the money. And I didn't know that I could syndicate. I mean, I had heard about it, but I was kind of jaded, right? And I didn't think it was real because she was a fraud. So everything she said, I thought was probably not viable, you know? Um, And so it was the slow, painful process of being told no no, no, for a couple of years by banks. And I just decided, you know what, all I can do is, is hope that, you know, when I get laid off, I'll get a severance package. And then I can use that to buy another one, maybe with the partner. And I would just have to keep working on fixing up my own units to create equity so that when the banks did say, yes, I had enough equity in them to buy more. And that's exactly what we did. We started working on our own 12 units at that time, raise the values. And then we looked into creative financing and I started buying properties from retiring landlords who couldn't get buyers because they couldn't get financing. And we worked out win-wins and I bought a few more four unit buildings. And that was kind of my, my slow growth to wealth was almost all four unit apartment buildings. And, you know, it made us a multimillionaire way before we ever started joint ventures and syndications, but it took about 10 years to do it. Wow. That's a, that, I mean, that's a part of the story that so many people miss, I think, is, is just the grind. You know, yeah. I was having uh, breakfast with somebody yesterday morning, you know, has done extraordinarily well in real estate. And he goes, man, he goes, the last 20 years, he goes, our growth really has happened the last two or three years. Yeah. The first 17 have been a, just a, 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 a grind and hustle. So, Absolutely. you know, that's, um, and then I, I think that that's an encouraging story too, because there's a lot of times you hear, oh, we just, you know, started some real estate and had meteoric growth. And here we are, you know, multimillionaires off you go. And you're like, wait, no, cause I'm, I don't fit that bill. right? <laughs> like I'm over here hustling. So I'm yeah. glad to hear it's, it's kind of refreshing. I'm sorry that that's the truth, but it's kind of refreshing to hear, you know, perspective of something that, that that's, that's grounded out. Oh, for sure. You know, and most people that I know, Sam, that are really doing well, that have created wealth that's solid, you know, that isn't going anywhere, that just aren't taking, you know, crazy risks and the timing just happens to work out. There are people that have been doing this for a really long time. You learn, you know, through years and years of mistakes and, you know, doing it the hard way. And then, you know, things click and and you gain wisdom on how to do it more quickly and better the next time. And, you know, if you started in a recession, it, it was nothing but grind. You know, if you got through a few years and then you jumped in the game, like a lot of syndicators honestly did, and it's no not to them. They were very blessed to jump in when they did. But, you know, if you started in 2010, 2012, 2015, you've seen nothing but prosperity and growth that's allowing those apartment buildings to become worth a lot more money than when you bought them. And so, you know, that's it's great that it's worked out that way. But now that we're kind of in a recession and we're in very difficult financial times again, um, we're not going to see that same kind of growth without a significant amount of, of hard work um, to make these deals really pan out and, and be wise investments. Well, let's talk about that for a second. I mean, we certainly are in uncharted waters, you know, financially speaking, there's no map for what we've been doing with our financial uh, system, you know, pumping right. all this money into it, printing just willy nilly money. This is just, it's a wild time. And so how are you as an investor, you know, like you said, we've seen, we've seen just nothing but a, a, you know, growth over the last eight, 10 years. How are you as an investor changing your habits to protect yourself if things do turn down? That's a really great question, Sam. And you know what, one of the things I learned through the end of 2008 and 2009 was, you know, I had been in the financial industry for several years at that point, over 10 years. And I thought I knew a lot about investments and the economy. And, you know, I, I worked for Bank of America and AIG, 
but I realized that there was so much about the financial system that impacted what I did and our investors that I didn't understand, like, you know, how mortgage backed securities are sold on the secondary market and, you know, how, how um, betting against them can, you know, really cause companies to crash. And so I learned that it's the things that you don't see that really can happen and, and hit you hard. So you have to prepare by learning to mitigate all the other risks that you can see and saying, if this happens and this happens and this happens, how will I react in the future? And what do I need to do to kind of balance my portfolio and have some diversification so that any one thing that happens doesn't completely take us down financially like it did before? And so I became a, a student of the economy and watching economics. And so about the end of 2018, I believed we were heading toward recession. There was a lot of indications and the Fed started to raise rates because they thought economy's booming. And as soon as they did, there was a massive ripple effect that said, okay, we're not quite as stable, let's back rates back down. Right. So I knew you know, we're, we're teetering, but we were in the longest expansion period in the United States, the longest period since Abraham Lincoln was president. And even though history doesn't tell us everything, it tells us that you know, after a long expansion and hyper supply, which we were in through a lot of the country, you come down and you hit recession. Right. So I started selling properties um, through the through 2019. I started saying, you know what, I'm going to sell some. I'm going to get liquid. Used to be, I wanted to spend every penny of cash that I had on another investment. I was highly leveraged and didn't have a lot of cash, and so I decided this is the time to start really saving some money. And being prepared that if the economy does crash, um, if we have another great recession type of thing, we've got liquidity that we can use to cover higher vacancies or potentially having to lower our rents. And thank God I did that because then we had the pandemic. And you know we managed hundreds of units for ourselves and our investors during a pandemic when people couldn't pay. And it was having that liquidity that allowed me to sleep at night, even though there was so much beyond my control. And so that's part of it for me, Sam, is having liquidity and not spending everything and really learning to say no to good and average deals and say yes only to the very best deals that are going to do three things, preserve my wealth, preserve my investor's wealth. If the economy struggles and, and takes a few years to recover, then income and then growth. You know, I'd love to see growth. We invest in deals that have a lot of upside and the potential, but we know that as the consumer psyche has been shaken during this pandemic, people aren't going to pay $300 more rent just to get a stainless steel appliance, nicer vinyl plank flooring than they already have, and nicer granite than they already have. Um, that's not going to work anymore. It does when, when the economy is booming and when people feel like the money's never going to end. But people are rocked right now. And so we have to be very careful about what we think the consumer really will pay for and how much value we can add. So I'm looking for stable deals that have income that are doing well today, stabilized today, where I can get Fannie and Freddie debt, not going for bridge debt, because that, that has risks that I don't want to take right now. Um, and if I can hold it long time, if I, don't, if I can get rates locked for 10 years, then I know that I've got some malleability so that we know when to sell and we don't have to sell because we have a bridge loan that's coming due. Right. We don't have to sell because, you know, if we continue at this point, we, we're, our IRR is going to go down because the market, you know, has softened a little bit. Cap, rate, cap rates have gone up and prices have come down. So if I have a longer term debt at a very low rate, then I can have some time for the economy to recover and not be forced to my exit but I can decide when it's the best time to exit based upon what happens with interest rates, what happens with cap rates, when the recovery moves more to a growth phase and, and just have more control over when I sell the asset um, to control our, our preservation of what we have, plus how much upside we have. And that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And I, and I think on, from the investor side or from the, from the sponsor side, you know, that makes me feel good, right? But when it comes to the projection side of things, you know, we, there's, a, there's a, a slight conflict there because we want to build in a five-year exit, right? We want to build in that. How, how do you balance that with, you know, presenting something that investors, that intrigue them? 
because there's a way to to make an investment look like it's going to be the best in, or, or the safest <laughs> investment in the world, but the returns could be absolutely nothing. Like, well, this, you know, we're going to hold it for 20 years, and your IR is like 2%. So you're like, well, that's that's a terrible investment. And then you get nobody to buy in. So how do you, how do you balance those out? Yeah, I, th- I think a few things. You know, the biggest thing is an investment is made or broken based on the team that's running the deal. And so, you know, I have years and years of experience working with high net worth investors, ultra high net worth investors, like $100 million portfolios, banks and corporations and institutions that are investing their money. And I see how they their brokers and their agents talk about returns. And one of the things that I see in the syndication space and investors who are used to investing in syndications is they all talk about IRR, but very, very wealthy people don't care as much about IRR. And the reason for that, Sam, is because we don't control the time value of money. And we don't know that when we sell and exit the first investment opportunity, that there's something just as good waiting for us at the point that we exit. So I might have a deal that says it's going to be 18% IRR. And if it performs and checks all the boxes and everything goes right according to my underwriting, and I hit that number, I can sell that great property, but I might not be able to find a deal that I can purchase at at as good of a basis. I might have to overpay for that deal because of where we are in the economy like today, right? Interest rates may be different. Um, The type of debt available on those new deals could change. You know, Fannie and Freddie on a new multi could say no more IO, you know, if your deal's already stabilized. Um, They could require a higher debt coverage ratio, which they are right now, more reserves, which, you know, basically dilute the returns because you have to raise more money. So IRR makes an assumption that everything remains the same. And in reality, that doesn't happen. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I don't have to sell to juice my IRR. If I have a really strong property and a really strong market, that's gonna provide stable returns and I have the ability to refi at that point or put a supplemental on it, we can get a lot of our cash back and then go redeploy that cash while keeping the asset. And that allows me also some flexibility when tax codes change, which we're seeing right now. There's a lot of changes coming um, and those things significantly impact IRR. So I talk to my investors and I try to educate them on why IRR is not the holy grail for your investments. You really need to think about where are we in the economy and what's your first and foremost financial strategy. In a growth period, it's growth, right? In a period of recession and uncertainty, and there's a lot of uncertainty ahead, asset preservation is absolutely most important, way more important than my IRR or growth. I need a deal that's going to preserve my wealth, that's going to you know, mitigate a lot of these risks and unknowns. And then if it has some income and some upside too, and tax benefits, that's a really strong investment for where we are today and the types of risks that we have ahead of us. Hey, yeah, those are that's those are excellent points, and I think that's um, I mean, that's, again, going back to Warren Buffett's, you know, rule number one and two is never lose money. Um, yes, so it's like okay, you know, and, and I and, and that's yeah, it's a very valid, and I, and I love that point. Let's talk a little bit about going back to your liquidity. Uh, scenario. I know you guys said you got liquid last year, or I guess mm-hmm. 2019, which helped you kind of weather the storm of 2020. How do you protect that liquidity? Because it's tough, you know, as you see things inflating in price, as you see, you know, consumer goods going up in price, how do you protect that dry powder from not just becoming less and less worth or worth less and less over time? Yes. So there's a couple of things that I do. I do believe that inflation is ahead. You know, I could be wrong. My crystal ball doesn't always work, right? Um, But I believe that inflation is ahead. And so you don't want cash that's going to be basically deflated because of of rising costs, because of inflation. So you're kind of in this middle where you want to protect, but you also know that sitting on too much could, could devalue that. And so I do take some of my cash and rather than keeping it in a bank account, I've got it in some um, liquidity type funds that provide somewhere between six and 10% return on my money, but I can get them pretty quickly. I can access it within 30 to 90 days. And so, you know, some of that allows me to still have some stable returns and then, you know, balances out the zero that I'm getting on cash. So I might be making, you know, three to 5%. But listen, Sam, the, the, really, the really big institutional investors, they're pretty smart. They've got pretty smart people and economists on their staff. And the reason they're buying multifamily right now and really 
making prices go up for syndicators like us is because they know it's a safe place to park money as a preservation of capital play. They're not focused on getting their investors 10, 14, 20% right now. They're saying, let's put it on something stable, an asset that's going to go up in value with inflation. The income is going to go up with inflation because if expenses go up, we're raising rents. And their primary is preservation of capital. So I am starting to invest some of that cash that I held in deals right now that are smaller for my own portfolio, Mm -hmm. where they will go up in value. I'll have some income. I might not have quite as much growth because I'm paying top dollar for those assets like everyone else's. Um, But by buying some smaller properties, I have some malleability where if it's time to exit, I I can exit really quickly. Um, without having to ask, you know, 100 investors and my GPs, can I sell? So buying some smaller properties allows me the flexibility to sell a few if I need to and get money quickly, um, as well as investing in some other opportunities. Those are, those are, I mean, golly, you're making, you're making just a a million and one really, really, I think, sound um, arguments here. I love that the buying the smaller properties thing. The other, other, I think, thing about this, you know, holding liquidity, is that even if it does go down, say the purchasing power, let's say it's a million bucks and it goes down, say it's only worth $900,000 of purchasing power in a year. But if we have a downturn, your opportunity to buy things at a discount may well than, may more than well make up for that difference. Absolutely. That's a really great, important point. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a, but it is a balancing act. So tell me about some things maybe in the last 10 years, you know, of your guys' growth, some things that maybe you would do differently. Are there some things you'd say, gosh, if I could kind of rework that, I would do it this way instead. Yes, lots of things. You know, I'm always thankful for the path that I took because it, it makes us wiser and it makes us realize, you know, the, the reality of one way. And then we see the other way and it's like, okay, I, I could I could do this and it could be a little faster for the next 10 years, right? I would have done syndications and joint ventures sooner. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, no doubt. Um, I did everything on my own. I, I should say my own and my husband. I have to give him credit as well. So, you know, we bought our own properties and I handled the financial side and the finding the properties and the business plan and the working with the the money and the banks and the lenders. And he was responsible for updating the units and handling, you know, overseeing the maintenance and the supervision. And when you work full time and you have children like we do, we have four and you're doing real estate on the side, it truly becomes 70 to 80 hours a week for a decade. And that, that, that's the reality of our lives for 12 years, really. Um, so when we started doing joint ventures and sharing the responsibilities, we were making so much more money for, for our time, you know, the, the dollar on the time versus we're handling every small thing like opening every bill, writing every check, handling every tenant call. Um, I learned to value the the dollar amount on my time and to really start delegating and hiring out and partnering out things that weren't the highest and and best use of my time that were going to make me the most money with the most joy. So definitely, I'd say I would have started partnerships and syndications much, much sooner. I think that's the biggest thing I would have done differently. Yeah, that's that that's amazing. Uh, What was that process like for you, you know, transitioning from all right, I'm doing this all on myself to because I think that's a, a tough transition for most people is now going, all right, now I got to raise capital. So what was that like? You know, I decided first to start doing some joint ventures. And so I had a partner on a property, I had another partner on a couple properties. And then I found a 73 unit apartment building and I thought, OK, I'm going to syndicate it. I have this off market opportunity, a really good opportunity but I need to raise about $2 million. And I had never raised money. I had asked a partner to partner with me, but never raised. And so I found a partner who he had money investors um, that helped fund his flipping business and his um, home building business, but he didn't really have the, the multifamily scale. So we decided, hey, let's get together. And if we find a deal, I can find the deal, you can find the money, let's see you know, how we do. And the first investor we went to said, I love the deal. I love what y'all are doing. I love your experience. I'll fund the whole thing. So we did the first joint venture with one, one investor. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. We, we worked through you know, how it needed to be structured. And I learned a lot of give and take for the benefit of everybody. Gave up more than I wanted to, but I knew it was the right decision. And since then, my my two partners and I have bought 240 units together here locally as a joint venture. 
And that gave me the confidence to say, if I, you know, if I can do it on a, we own everything scale, surely I can do it, you know, raising money from, from other investors. And I did have experience working with investments for 20 years. So I did private banking. And so I, I was very comfortable talking about money um, and talking about the, you know, financial strategies. And that made it much easier for me to transition. The hardest part for me was learning to give up control um, and, and knowing that other people could do things well enough that I could trust them to do it and focus on what I needed to do. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. What were some of the things that you had to give up on that first deal? Maybe that today you wouldn't necessarily structure it the same way. Um, I gave up more acquisition fee than I wanted to, and I gave up a higher percentage of ownership than I wanted to. Um, but, but I needed to do that. I also realized that he was funding the entire deal. And so he had a lot more risk in it than I did. We all signed on the loans. Um, but you know, the trade-off was essentially, you know, you're trusting me with a couple million dollars worth of your money. And I need to be able to say, you know, if I don't do a good job, you can buy me out, you can take over the property. And so, you know, I, I understood his desires and his needs to have more control and, and to, you know, not give me such a big acquisition fee initially. Um, and, and we did some negotiation and landed where we were very comfortable. Um, but now that I've done, you know, syndications and I've been, you know, really had multifamily since 2007, um, I have, I have the confidence that I can raise money from any uh, investors. I don't necessarily need, you know, one investor. Um, there's beauty of doing it that way. And I love joint ventures as, as much or more honestly than I love syndications just because of that level of long-term hold and control. Um, but, but I, I did give up more than I wanted to, but it was the right decision and it yielded to a long-term partnership that's done really well for all of us. That's great. And I think that's, that's a, a point that many people who are, who are just starting to scale need to keep in mind is that sometimes, you know, the, the speed of the money is worth more than the price of the money. Uh, yeah. especially on your first deal. Like, well, you, 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 your, your, your objective here is to get it done. Yes. Take a little bit along the way and establish that track record, not necessarily hit a home run, uh, you know, on the first, first at bat. Absolutely. So that's, uh, that, that's really fantastic. Anna, I've enjoyed this. We're out of time. So let's jump here into the final four questions. The first one's this, if I gave you just 20,000 bucks to invest in real estate and you had no previous real estate investing experience, what would you do with it and why? I would see if I could find a partner to buy together a four unit apartment building or a duplex, whatever you could do. I'd buy your own property first. $20,000 isn't enough to really be in, in a syndication and make meaningful money on it. And it's gonna lock up that only $20,000 you have for a very long time. So buy your own property, learn small, um, commit to educating yourself even through the, the process of buying that property. And, and once you learn and you build some equity, buy something that needs some, has some ability to force the value, raise the value, cash out more equity, keep that property, and then use that bigger chunk of change for the next deal and the next deal. And once you grow more wealth, at that point, start investing passively with other people. Got it. That's great. If you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't buy stuff that you don't understand just because you want to make money. <laughs> oh, you're speaking my language. I felt that. I felt that answer. That uh, <laughs> been there. Great, great answer. Question number three is this. When it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? This is something I am so passionate about. I wish we had another hour just to talk about it. But for me, my company, Greater Purpose Capital, we really are committed to investing for meaningful impact. So what that means, Sam, is we go in and we really make a difference in the lives of our residents so that while we're producing strong returns for our investment, our investors, we're really producing returns in the lives of our residents through financial literacy, through community partnerships, and really trying to make um, their apartment community a place that they really feel home. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. Anna, last yeah. question. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Thank you so much. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram, or YouTube at Anna, REI Mom Kelly. And if you are a accredited investor looking for passive opportunities, you can find me at greaterpurposecapital.com. Wonderful. And that's Anna spelled A-N-N-A. 
Is that Anna REI mom? What was that again? Kelly, K E L L E Y. Got it. Okay. Fantastic. Anna, thank you so much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Thanks, Sam. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.